Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast. Portal season is here. I'm Matt Frame, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on the show as always. We're going to break it all down. Portal season opened today. There's already been a couple entries from Oregon, which was expected. There'll be more to come following this recording. A bunch more. Uh, Oregon will go after names. Big names have already hit the portal. Uh, and we've also got, we're going to start the show with some talk on a decision by Oregon's current quarterback, Bo Nix, in the bowl game. Uh, but first, I want to give listeners an opportunity. If you missed that 75% off chance to subscribe to DuckTerritory.com, um, we didn't decide this, but the people up at 24-7 Sports decided, hey, let's give those people a chance. Uh, 60% off an annual subscription uh, for the next couple of days as the portal opens. So if you missed out on that 70% off, 75% off deal, uh, here's a chance to get a year's worth of coverage for $42.96. That gets you all of portal season. It gets you the rest of the signing day period for the 2024 recruiting class. Signing days in 16 days. Um, crazy to think about. You get all the basketball coverage. You get Jared's baseball coverage. You get spring football. And, oh, by the way, with – Signing up right now, you get all of next season. Oregon's first season in the Big Ten, uh, all included in that forty-two ninety-six. So, uh, highly encourage you guys to sign up if you missed it. It's the best way to support this podcast. Or if you know like a Duck fan that would love to have a membership, this is a great Christmas gift as well. Um, all right, let's dive into the show, guys. First and foremost, we need to talk a little. We need to at least mention. The Fiesta Bowl. Oregon's going to the Fiesta Bowl. They're playing Liberty. We'll talk about this more in detail down the road. Probably not this week. Um, but we should talk about the fact that I think Eric and I were on here, and I probably – I don't want to speak for Jared, but maybe Jared felt like he was done too after the comments that Bo Nix made um, in Vegas. But a couple of days later, it's some time to reflect – Dan Lanning says that Bo met with the team, met with him, and has indicated he wants to play in this Fiesta Bowl. I'm honestly shocked. I don't know if you guys are or not. Um, I don't think he should be playing in this bowl game. But if he wants to, you absolutely take him. Uh, you absolutely embrace the idea that you get one more game with Bo Nix. But it's it's a move that that's awesome for Oregon. It's a move he didn't have to make for Oregon either. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm on the record right after the bowl game saying I didn't expect him to, um, partly based upon what he said in front of the camera, partly based upon kind of the interactions we had after. I mean, he gave all the media guys who covered him basically a hug. There was kind of a line of us and shook our hands and thanked us for for covering them and had a couple of choice words for each of us. So it kind of felt like a, a farewell. Um, but, you know, honestly, I don't know if I should have been sweat as definitive, just based upon what happened last year, where a lot of people were wondering what he would do. and he played in that bowl game and, and just the competitor he is. And to Matt's point, like, yeah, there's probably no real benefit from a professional perspective of playing in this game. And you get to this point in the season and that's the decision you're weighing is, okay, am I hurting my professional stock? Am I really helping, you know, is there anything really to play for here? But clearly Bo feels there's something to play for at Oregon still. And I know this season was disappointing. We outlined why in our, in our articles and podcasts, et cetera, over the last 48 hours. Clearly, Bo felt there was something of value to finish it off here. And, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for him, as I have the entire time he's been here for this choice. And frankly, like, I think this makes this game a lot more compelling to me. We can argue about whether or not you'd rather watch Ty Thompson and get a sense of what that is for four quarters, because maybe there's some validity to that point. But a, a Bo Nix send off is, is going to be at least something that'll add some, some more entertainment to this game for me, at least. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, we've heard all season long about how competitive Bo is, and to, to for him to just say, ah, you know, I don't really want to play. We're just going to go to the professionals, and that's going to be it. Um, I just never thought that was going to happen. Um, there's not much other than being injured that can affect his draft stock right now. We've gotten you know five full seasons of what Bo Nix is, and two with the Ducks, and three with Auburn. So it's not much more he can prove, good or bad, in that bowl game. Um, and I think this is just his commitment to the sport. Um, I think that uh, we all saw it last year when he was injured versus Washington and still came back and played the final two games of the season, uh, I think, and the bowl game too. Uh, I think we see it every single moment he steps onto the field this year. 
Um, and again, every single moment he stepped on the field last year, I think he's just a committed individual um, who gave his promise to Oregon to come back and play a full season. Um, and I think he's just upholding that promise that he gave a long time ago. And I'm, I'm not overly surprised. Yeah, he got all philosophical towards the end of uh, the uh, towards his press conference and against Washington after the Pac-12 championship game. But he does that a lot. And he did the exact same thing after the first time they lost to Washington. Um, I don't really think that changes his mindset too much. I think that's just kind of the the person that he is. I think he does a good job of kind of like getting uh, football out of the way and talking about more of like a generic perspective that regular day humans live rather than just thinking about football all the time. So I think that's just who Bo Nix is in most of his answers. Um, he just doesn't get as uh, introspective as he did against Washington, but I'm not surprised. I'm excited. I think it'll be a better game. Um, I think it's, you know, indicative uh, for, for Oregon's future that, Bo Nix plays, and I think it's a good like look into the window about where they feel about Ty Thompson that uh, they're going to have Bo play, and they probably ask Bo to play. I I think we could get both. I, I think there's a real possibility that if it's a blowout, sure. Even if it's not, I I think I think we could see Bo something similar to what like Oregon State did with Aiden Childs this season, um, and the idea that. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna give Ty one series in the first half and one series in the second half, just to throw him out there unless the score allows it. And maybe maybe they just plan on blowing the doors off Liberty and giving Ty as much time in the second half as they possibly can get. Um, but I I kind of think we see both. Um, it's 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 bull season. Dan even talked about like. Uh, you see trick plays, you see funky things happen in bull games. I don't think that was by just him throwing it out there. Um, I, I I think I think we'll see both personally. It's not going to be a 50-50 split unless the score requires it to be, but I, I think we'll see we'll see Ty Thompson in the first half, I think. I don't know. We'll see. I, I really I don't have any reason to believe yeah. one way or the other. I mean, I think they're gonna try to win the game and I would imagine mm-hmm. Bo playing is what gives them Obviously, the best chance. All right. Um, let's transition now to the portal because as we were talking, another one just hit. Um, Damon David is the latest to go into the transfer portal for the Oregon Ducks. But the first one happened before the portal even opened. That was Ashton Cozart. Uh, he announced on social media Thursday, I believe it was, when Eric and I landed into the Vegas Um that he was going to put his name into the portal. I, I have yet to actually see his name officially in there, um, but his intentions were made. Um, Dan was asked about it yesterday and didn't really say other than just good luck. Um, and this morning we've, we've seen a couple other guys um, go, go into the portal. Uh, Damon David most recently – um, Chris Hudson is another one that's not a surprise. And then I think a surprise to all of us in that he has years of eligibility left somehow, but not necessarily the fact that he's le- choosing to leave Oregon and that's senior Brian Addison. Um, we, we just didn't think he had a year of eligibility. I think Eric in our Slack channel privately was saying maybe he could get a waiver of some kind from a past injury or something. He only played in four games this season, but um, that's where things currently stand as of 924 on Monday. That list will grow. We'll have a reaction to it. But um, so far, among these four guys, I don't think there's really any impact. And I don't, and I don't mean that in a negative way towards these players or we didn't want them anyways type stuff. It's just all four of these guys didn't play much. Um, all four of these guys – probably either weren't going to be on the team next season because they graduated or the chances that they have bigger roles next year weren't going to be very high either way. This is just the nature of the beast. These guys want to play. They're going to look somewhere else. I mean, let's be honest. All four of these guys weren't dressing at home games at parts of the season. None of these guys were really traveling regularly. I know Chris Hudson made the final trip. I think that had probably more to do with Gary Bryant's injury than much of anything else. Um, like, yeah, these are the guys you expected. I mean, for those of us who go to practice and follow all this stuff, like, 
been talking about for a while what a list would look like for guys who could leave. And these four guys were right at the top, you know, and credit to all of them for sticking with the team and going to practice and all of that good stuff. But yeah, no surprises here. None of these guys were factoring into this year's roster. And I don't really think any of them would have factored into anything in the future. And I hope we don't continue to get the Chris Hudson questions now. He's not no longer part of the Good team. Lord, thank Christ. I think it was pretty clear that he really wasn't a part of the team from a what happens on Saturday perspective the entire season. So uh, we can put that behind us. The Brian Addison thing, just last thing on that, I, I agree. If you run through it, it seems like he's used six years of eligibility, including a redshirt and the COVID year. So I don't know where he gets another year. Maybe there's a, a waiver this year. He did leave the team after, I think, five weeks, but four games played. Because um, he didn't play at Stanford. But then he, let, he was – Dan announced he left right before or during the bye week, I think. Um, so maybe he's got an extra year there. I wish him nothing but the best. Again, a lot of these guys are, are, are high-quality individuals that we've, we've interviewed and talked to for years. So nothing – no disrespect, but um, none of these are impactful to me really at all. And – None of these guys are guys that I expect to have massive careers anywhere else either, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, none of these were a surprise. Um, for those listening, I pre-wrote 23 articles for this week, and uh, these guys were on the list. So uh, they were targets that we kind of anticipated we could see going into the transfer portal. Um, there's always going to be a surprise or two. Don't get us wrong. And uh, honestly, one of them was Brian Addison because – well, I just didn't think he had any more years of eligibility left. But like Eric just went through, he he might, he might not. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, these are these are players that very clearly once Oregon uh, rebranded their entire team with the addition of Dan Lanning and got rid of fifty to sixty players that Mario Cristobal had on this team. Um, that these were a surprise to still be here in the first place. It didn't seem like they really fit into the system that Dan Lanning had. Um, obviously, they were Mario Cristobal recruits um, other than Ashton Cozart. Um, but Ashton Cozart's more of a uh, just maybe he's just not going to play and that he's probably a little homesick from Texas and that um, it's probably better to get it out than stay in and try to fight up the ladder. But you know, this is what Oregon's going to do. This is what the transfer portal is. This is all should be no surprise to anybody who's been listening over to our podcast for the last year. Players are going to come in and players are going to leave. And then that's going to continue to happen in the spring too, when there's another transfer portal window after Oregon and every team in the country theoretically goes and adds talent. Um, this time around, it's just, uh, it's just going to be a, a rather hectic day because it's the opening of the transfer portal. And it's an exciting time because there's big names, but there's certainly instances like the players that Oregon has had enter the transfer portal where it's a bit of a smaller level. And these types of players may get another Power 5 opportunity, or they may not. And that those are the risks that you have when you enter the transfer portal. And it's not a fun business. Um, but again, like Eric said, you know, you wish – Nothing but the best for all these guys because they came in here with high aspirations and and um, great integrity and with a coaching staff that they loved and um, some of that can just be flipped on its head real fast and uh, you know I I hope that they all end up where exactly where they want to end up but uh, for now it's just the the four four players who are in the portal um, like I said to begin this all uh, I expect a little bit more than four players to enter the portal from Oregon. I. I think it's safe to think it could be variants of five or six below or above 20. Um, I, I think that's just the reality of college football. That's not going to be some indication of things aren't going well when that locker room for Oregon, because I think you look across the country and if you find a school that has less than five transfers at the end of the year, it's probably going to be like a handful, five or six schools that have that few players leave. Um, you're going to see schools go through like 40 new players. You're going to see schools add, see 15 guys leave. And I think some, you know, Oregon's going to be somewhere in the middle, just like everybody else that's out there. Um, and then let's transition right to um, Jared's story. He posted this last week. Um, we'll put it up on the front page of deckterritory.com. Um, positions that Oregon should target in the in the portal. Uh, 
first one is quarterback. Do we need to go into discussion of, of why Oregon needs to get a, a, a portal quarterback? Jared, do you, do you want to do that, or would you like to go and pick a second position group that is less obvious? Uh, no, I think that is very clearly the obvious one. Yeah, no, I know. I thought I thought I would go through and kind of give a little spiel about um, why I picked all of these because you guys are – more than capable of having different ideas than I am where we are not all uh, brain centric here and have shared the same uh, nerves and everything like that. We can all think differently. Um, but I had quarterback as my number one for the most obvious reasons. Don't think too hard about that one. If you're listening or if you're watching, uh, my, that was my top priority. Then I, I divided it into top priority and then high priority, medium priority, low priority and a wild card. But a high priority was just to fill in the defensive line. Um, Oregon is losing a bunch of guys just due to eligibility, like Casey Rogers, Brandon Dorless, Taki Taimani. Um, they're going to lose probably Jordan Birch to the draft. Uh, Mace Funa is another guy who's just gone. Um, there's definitely going to be players who hit the transfer portal like we were just talking about. Um, and a lot of those could come from the defensive line. They could not come from the defensive line. We'll all find out eventually. But Oregon will need to – replenish their defensive front and especially especially their interior line because um, like five of their top six contributors are all gone after this year and they Oregon is certainly adding talent through the 2024 class they certainly added talent in the 2023 class however uh, it's a lot to lean on and there's going to be opportunities for really good defensive linemen to hit the transfer portal that I think Oregon should go after to solidify that and not put a lot of pressure on a true freshman. Like if Aiden Breland and Elijah rushing, if those guys sign, if they land Jericho Johnson and he signs like, or any of the guys from last year, the Johnny Bowens, the Amari Washington's, the Terrence greens of the world. Like it's going to be a lot to ask for those guys to step up and perform to the level that Casey Rogers, Taki Taimani, Brandon Dorless, and all these other guys did a seasons ago, a Popo Amabai a season ago, because that's, if you're Oregon, that's where you need your defensive line to be, especially moving into the Big Ten. Um, thoughts? Anybody? Yeah, uh, no, I'm I'm in total agreement. I just wanted to my, my add on would be um, I'd be curious to see you're talking primarily internal guys, and you brought up Mace. I'd be curious to see if they go after a veteran edge guy, just because I think they should. I yeah, think, I, I think that makes a lot of sense too as a priority, just because they the guys they return are I'm players I'm really high on. Like I, I think Mateo Tatum and Purchase are going to be really good players. I think Elijah Rushing is going to be a good player. Amari and Winston quietly actually had a pretty good year this year, especially mm -hmm. on rundowns. So they have some bodies, but I think they can get somebody who's a little bit more experienced out there, especially on passing downs, would probably be a nice, just a nice add. So no, I'm in total yeah. agreement with with your your list so far. Yeah. I I think this is a group that you go out and you find best player available at probably all three spots, interior D line, defensive tackle and edge rush outside linebacker, yeah. defensive end, whatever we want to call that guy. Um, I, I think you go and, and you try and find a guy at each spot. So three, three portal guys, um, because like you guys said, Dorless, Casey, Taki, Funa, Popo are all graduating and, you think about those names and that's kind of like your main group of, of, of guys on the interior. Mm -hmm. um, Birch is probably, I agree with Jared. I think, I think Birch is probably gone to the NFL. Um, and what you're left with is a lot of unproven talent. And if you want to compete for a conference championship, if you want to compete for, a national championship and make the playoffs a 12 team group, you have to like, ask yourself is a core group of Mateo and purchase and Tatum and Winston uh, and Keon Ware Hudson and Ben Roberts. Um, there's other, a couple other guys too, in that group, all the freshmen that redshirted last this past season. Like, is that what you want to ride into the okay corral with? I probably not. Probably want more. Nope. So I, I would agree with that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think edge is important. I thought you saw Washington go attack the edge for a lot of the game, after, especially after Jordan Birch got hurt um, because Tatum and Mateo and Blake Purchase, Blake Purchase only had eight snaps, but uh, they're just not big enough. And that's not their fault. They're true freshmen, um, but they need to address that. All right. My second high priority was wide receiver. 
Um, I think this was the one I got some pushback from, which I was surprised about, um, because everybody seems to think that Tez Johnson is a lock to return. Why? Bo Nix, his brother, is gone after the season. He, Tez Johnson certainly can leave. Now, it would probably behoove him to come back for another season at Oregon and get stronger and showcase his talents once again, but I don't know. He was pretty damn good this year, having over 1,000 yards and doing quite well. But obviously, the biggest reason they need to up, upgrade their wide, wide receiver position is Troy Franklin is gone. Yeah. And this was a primary two wide receiver offense through the last six games of the season. Um, they certainly can spread the ball around, but um, you need top, two top guys, clearly. That's when this op- offense is operating at its highest. And Troy leaving, being a first or second round pick, no brainer. We all expect him to go, and we're all very happy for him that he is going because he's yep. going to be a real NFL player. Um, Tess Johnson is up in the air, but I'm not 100% sure he comes back. He doesn't really have a reason to come back other than just trying to do well in his final year of college eligibility. Um, but then there's a huge gap in that third wide receiver position. Uh, will it be Gary Bryant? Will it be Treshawn Holden? Will either of those guys remain on the team? Will it be Jurion Dickey or Kyler Casper or somebody else? Will any of those guys stay on the team? Will it be somebody from the 2024 class? Um, I don't know, but it needs to be answered because right now there's a massive gap at that number one position, and there very quickly could be a massive gap at the number two position. Total agreement. And I think if you, especially if you think about it through the terms of you're just going to expect the quarterback position to not be as good next year as it was this year. Just point blank. Yeah. I mean, it would be, yeah. we'll get into, there's some incredible names, by the way, in the portal. We'll get into those, but you really don't want to see the receiving core downgrade the way you would if you lost Troy, certainly. And as you said, possibly Tez, this is a priority. You have to go get an outside guy who can be your number one. You have to go find an outside X. Um, maybe you think Tez can develop more into that. I don't know. I think he's pretty darn good where he is right now. And then they did utilize him at a couple of different spots too, but I think it's a, that would be offensively aside from quarterback. My top priority in the portal is going and finding mm-hmm. a true number one on the outside that you can pair with Tez in a best case scenario. And if you do lose Tez, obviously you really need to rework this whole thing because while I thought Gary Bryant and Treshawn Holden each had some awesome individual plays this season, like think about, the Arizona State touchdown for Gary Bryant. That's one of the better, you know, open field, you know, filled with different moves plays. You'll see Treshawn Holden similarly broke like three arm tackles, had a big touchdown to kind of keep their season alive there late in the fourth quarter. We just didn't see enough of it consistently. So I have a hard time being like, hey, those two guys are going to be great stepping into a number one receiver role. Well, they were their three and four this year for a reason. So I, I think the portal, and, and we've already seen some pretty impressive names enter in there and i think we'll see even more going forward i agree jared that's that's right up near the offensively outside of quarterback that's where i think you're starting to look and lucky for oregon like this is the position that i feel like the last couple of years when we look at the portal and the data that we see it's maybe the easiest to find a plug and play star player and and add into the mix like the talent at the quarterback position or at the receiver position in the portal already on day one is absolutely absurd. And, the, you know, the, the better schools, Oregon is one of those schools. They will get the pick of the litter. They will get most of the talent. But um, the playmakers that they have there, we we will see uh, Oregon go after and get guys. Because I agree. Like, I, I thought I did a story about a week ago of players that could go or, or should stay. And I said on Tez, like, I think he's going to stay, but it's now the hardest guy of the group to pick, let alone be Tez Johnson make that decision because Mm -hmm. of what he's done the second half of the season. Um, He had just 15 catches through the first, I think, five games or five weeks of the season. Um, That means he had 60 catches over Oregon's final seven games of the year. And he's over 1,000 yards now that 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 duo became – just the second, you know, combo to out of Oregon to go over a thousand yards in the same season, and like what Jared said, if he comes back, I think it's a clear indication that he and Oregon are very confident in what they have at quarterback because right. his NFL draft stock right now will be as high as it's ever been, and the only way to maintain that is to basically re- reproduce somewhat similar similar results to this season. And I don't know if you can confidently say 
that's going to be possible next season as of now, knowing what Oregon's roster looks like without Bo Nix. Maybe they find somebody that changes it, but Mm -hmm. this is a a truly hard decision to make. And even if he does come back, though, I don't think you can sit here and say, all right, Oregon's going to roll with Tez as your number one, Treshawn Holden, Gary Bryant, assuming those two guys also come back to school. And then you throw in a Jerion Dickey and maybe uh, an Addison that they've got currently committed or Kyle Casper. Like, I still don't think that's good enough. Like it, it's not, you, you, you need more, you, nope. you need more talent there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, I wrote about this in the, in the article. I think it will be like how a high school recruiting class is structured. You build around the quarterback, you get a commitment from. And once Oregon lands one in the portal, assuming that they do, which I think is a given at this point based on everything that we've heard, um, that receivers will see that and say, hey, that guy is pretty good. I should go play with him because that's going to increase my draft stock. That's going to increase, I don't know, if I decide to transfer again, I'll go from Oregon to blank instead of, no disrespect, FAU to Oregon, like something like that. Um, so I, I think that's how it's going to culminate is like Oregon's going to land a quarterback and then wide receivers are going to be like, oh, yeah, no, I, I would like to go play with him, please. And then they will commit to Oregon. Um, but, you know, we'll see. But I'm going to move on to my next high priority. Uh, actually, my medium priority. I probably should put this one a little bit higher. I think Oregon needs defensive back depth, um, specifically a cornerback, but they need real talent at safety. So if I could do this over again, I would split up the cornerback and safety positions and put safety at high priority and cornerback at medium priority. Because safety, every, the starting safeties other than Tysheem Johnson at star are gone. Evan Williams and Steve Stevens have simply run out of eligibility. Um, for the bemoaning of Steve Stevens over the past couple weeks of the season, um, he was great this year. He was a, a much a bunch improved player compared to the 2022 season. Um, he gave you as many snaps as he could every single day until Oregon was up by 30 and they took him out. Uh, he was a workhorse. He played well. He covered well. He tackled extremely well over the course of the season. I think he leads the team in tackling grade. It's either him or, guess what, Evan Williams, the other safety who's leaving with no eligibility left, who was also amazing. Um, he was a very welcomed addition to this team. Again, I know there's some bemoaning of his play against Washington, specifically the two times that they did match up, but um, he was awesome the entire season. He's going to be criminally missed, and Oregon will need to hit the transfer portal very hard to find suitable replacements for those guys because they both started every game. They played at every single competitive snap unless they were injured, and that's going to be a difficult thing to replace. So I would make safety help high priority. And cornerbacks, um, Kyrie Jackson's probably gone. And if I were him, I'd be leaving. And well, doesn't he have to leave? I thought we, I thought we did this beginning of the season that we made that. I thought he had earlier. another year, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't oh, know what he's listed at as on a Go Ducks, but he's he's a senior on Go Ducks. Let me look and see what I think his chances are. Go. Ahead. So. I don't know. Brian Addison somehow has eligibility. So maybe Kyrie can too, but uh, let's, so he's gone. He doesn't even have a choice. He's gone. Uh, He's Carlos Lachlan. We're not going to give him a choice. Um, So that's one down. Julio Florence obviously comes back, but you know, Triquist Bridges walked during senior day and still has a year of eligibility. That's some type of writing on the wall. And for those who don't like TriQuest Bridges, then I'm sure you're happy about it. But as a TriQuest Bridges supporter on this podcast, you know he's valuable corner depth. Um, he's a guy who started basically the entire 2022 season who's your fourth or fifth cornerback. Like That's really valuable. Um, Dante Manning is another guy who I know struggled against Washington and had his issues during the year, but that's valuable depth. Um, they might lose both. They might lose none. Uh, if they do, they're going to need to at least find one lockdown safety to replace Kyrie Jackson. And so that's going to be another problem. Or hopefully guys like Roderick Pleasant or Dalen Austin emerge. But again, you're, this is, goes back to like the defensive line idea. That's a lot of faith and a lot of pressure on that kid to perform. And maybe they're up to it. Maybe they're not. But they need to solidify the depth there no matter what. 
Um, Eric, I found that Jackson played one season of Juco ball um, in Texas and then played a spring season at East Mississippi Community College and then it's weird. Uh, got to Alabama um, ahead of the 2021 football season. Um, does the spring 2020 season count? I we, we don't know. And I think that's probably where the confusion comes. If it does, he's probably done. If it doesn't, I think he's got an extra year of eligibility, which would change everything. Um, I I remember this conversation that we had very early in the season. We were completely confused about what his eligibility with the COVID year is and isn't. And I don't think now on December 4th, we know what the final answer is regarding that either. Might be something we should ask Oregon officially. Like, Let's do that. What, be what's a bad his idea. eligibility clock? Because you get to Matt's point, he's got three years in the FBS level. He played two years Juco before that. One of those was a spring COVID season in 2020. So kind of seems like he's used four years for sure to me. But again, we were just as miffed this morning when Brian Addison entered the portal because we didn't think he had any eligibility. Um, Should he come back? Like, Kyrie? Even if he has, no. yeah, even if he has the eligibility, should he come I don't, back? I don't think I, he should. I don't think so, especially when you're this old. I mean, I, I don't know what he's really going to do to improve his stock. I mean, and 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 frankly, he needs to get healthy, too. Like, I mean, I, I mean, not that, that mm-hmm. it's not that the season starts next week for either, but like, I think I think he needs to get ready for the draft and get that shoulder healed up because that thing cost him so many snaps this year. Um, to the safety point, like. If you take Addison and, and David off this, which we were expecting anyway, you know, you take out Evan Williams and, Ty, and uh, Steve Stevens, sorry. Um, they have like Cole Martin. It's like five safeties. Four. Tyler Turner, Cody DeCambra, Taishim Johnson, Kamari Terrell, who's kind of, kind of a nickel, kind of a, I don't know. Like they really don't have a lot of stuff at safety, like period. So, and I know there, I know no. there are some rec- recruits that really like this class, but I don't know if you expect Aaron Flowers to come in and be like, a day one contributor um so yeah getting getting one or two deep safeties is a, is, is valuable and then jared out, outlined the corner stuff perfectly i don't have anything else to add there they need more, they need another uh, corner too one one quick note um based off of what ty turner's mom said on social media like after the the vegas bowl game um yeah she was not a happy camper it's unfair, but it's out in the public, and it's a family member of yours. Like, would not be surprised if Ty's on the t- not on the team next season because he transfers. She was very upset that her son did not play. Um, the, yeah, the way that that's, the, the tenor of that tweet, though, like that's just I mean, maybe I'm reading way too much into this. But the tenor of that tweet for me was I don't know weird. if it was. It, it we have no idea if it was indicative of how Tyler Tra- Turner actually feels. It could just be sure. motherly love and frustration. I fear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, we'll find out. It certainly wasn't a, certainly wasn't a great tweet to, to look at if you're an Oregon staffer. Um, but moving on medium priority, the last medium priority tight end. I'm here. I'm talking about it. I'm getting it out of the way early. I, this was my biggest concern all off season long last year. Uh, it didn't actually matter. Oregon was fine. They never actually had a real injury to any of their tight ends. Um, but Who's to say Terrence Ferguson doesn't enter his name into the NFL draft? That could be a big loss if you ask me. Because be then all of a sudden, draft. your number one tight end is Patrick Herbert. No disrespect to Patrick Herbert, of course, but then it's Casey Kelly, and then it's Kenyon Sadiq, and uh, then it's true freshmen. It's AJ Pugliano. It's Roger Saliapaga. It's guys who are in, who are incredibly unproven across the board and. Um, if you're Oregon and you can see what what Terrence Ferguson can do in this type of offense, imagine if you landed a player better than him, what he could do in this type of offense, and just add add more depth pieces because there's just not outside of Ferguson and Kenyon Sadiq, who's just a small boy, he needs to add another 20, 30 pounds of muscle onto him. Um, there's just not a lot of pure talent in that room. And I, 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 this is why it's a medium priority. It would be a luxury to have another tight end. And then again, and this is 
assuming Terrence Ferguson is going to enter his name in the NFL draft, which I think he should. I think he's proven to be a very versatile tight end at, the, at potentially at the professional level as well. But that's why it's a medium priority. I just I'm going to stay on this all year long, and this is just going to be my take that Oregon always will need one to two more tight ends. I expect him to go. Um, I was surprised how polarizing his draft stock was amongst Oregon fans. When Matt posted the NFL decision story, like he was the guy that people were like, what, why do you think he's going to go? And I'm, I'm like, I don't know. He's six foot six. He catches everything. And he uh, runs well. His and he catch blocks the decently. Yeah. championship game was absolutely ridiculous. So like, I, yeah, I, he's had some great catches recently. I'm, I'm not great at the project projecting or predicting draft round. I'm like, that's not what I do very well, but, I would be surprised if he's like a late day three guy. Like I think he's probably like a what third through fifth round pick kind of range. Probably I don't know. We'll see what he does in the combine. But I I, I would be surprised if he was back. To be honest, and some Jared's point, I think you need to go get yourself at least one more experienced player because if not, you're relying on Patrick Herbert, who I'm all on. I'm all in on the what a nice redemption his career has been. He had some really good moments this year. I think he could be your number one tight end and you're probably not going to be terrible, but you probably could go get somebody a, a little bit more reliable too. And, and you certainly need just a, a depth piece because to Jared's point, unless you're planning on playing a bunch of true freshmen next year, you have three guys and basically two of them have played much of anything. So I think um, if Ferguson does come back to Oregon, the need for a portal tight end, is still 100% there. The type of player that you're going after changes. Um, if Ferguson leaves, I, like what you guys said, you need you need a big play guy. You need a, a starting potential guy, someone that's been productive that you feel like it's just going to translate right over. There's very little risk involved that this guy is going to be a dude. If Ferguson doesn't go pro and comes back, and Oregon's tight end group is – T. Ferg, Herbert, Casey Kelly, Sadiq, and then the freshman that, that they have, I still think that there's value in going out and trying finding a guy that's got multiple years of eligibility that's cool with being on the team for more than one season. Because even if all those guys come back, the 2025 football season will have Kenyon, Sadiq, and a bunch of guys that probably redshirt. And that's you can go portal then too, and you should. But I think I'd like to have a at least another older player on the roster um, two years from now. And if that means an AJ Pugliano transfers out of the program in a couple of years because he gets passed over, so be it. You, you've got to go find a guy that gives you better depth, proven depth. Um, so I, I I just think Ferguson's decision impacts the type of guy that they're going to go after at the tight end spot. Hundred percent, I agree. They just need they need depth. They haven't done a great job recruiting tight end positions recently, other than Kenyon Sadiq. But we still don't exactly know what he's going to be. Although I'm I'm very high on the guy. I think he could be very good in this offense. I just quietly, it's been kind of something to monitor with Maringer. Just yeah. hasn't quite come together every cycle yet. I don't know. We'll see. Sadiq's, he's got, Sadiq's he's probably he's going been, to be a great player. I just there's just been yeah. a little bit of disappointment in my head. He's got two this this cycle, the 24 class, so it's better. But, yeah, it's something to monitor. All right, I'm going to go through my low priorities pretty quick. Um, offensive line and running back. Uh, offensive line, you feel good about who's returning. Um, obviously, it's still, still yet to be decided who puts their name in the draft, who goes into the portal it's day one. But you know that you're getting Connor Lee Jr. back because he just can't go anywhere. He's a sophomore. Um, uh, Marcus Harper, you feel good that he's not going to leave because he probably would have left last season if he were going to leave. Um, Stephen Jones is obviously gone, but you feel good about the replacement. You have Poncho, Ipani, Lalulu um, as, a re as a replacement for either him or Jackson Powers Johnson if JPJ decides to enter his name in the NFL draft, which unfortunately for Oregon fans, I think he should. He's quite good at the center position. So, Poncho fills in there. I think Oregon's done a great job of, of um, developing talent in the interior offensive line positions with guys like Dave Ayuli. Um, they can all, Nashad Struther, I believe, has another year of eligibility. Um, 
And so he can be another guy that that stays on the team and competes for a starting role like he did last year during fall camp, but then suffered an injury. Um, and then a Johnny Cornelius. If he decides to come back, it's a pretty good offensive line you'll have there with Cornelius, Poncho or Dave Ayuli, Poncho at center, Harper, and then Josh Connerly. That's formidable. That's may, maybe not as good as this year, but you know, none of us expected this year's offensive line to be as good as it was the, the season before. And it was pretty damn good all year. So I don't think it's much of a concern there. I think you go out, you get some depth pieces. You can never have too much depth at the offensive line. Um, and then running back, you got a bunch of dudes already. I don't, I don't really think you need any, but unless you're going huge game hunting, like I would like the number one running back in the country, please type of game hunting. I don't think you need anybody. I like Noah Whittington. I like Jordan James. Sophomore seasons for Jaden Lamar and Dante Dowdell. Um, I think you're pretty set there. And then you get Dewan Riggs as long as he signs with Oregon in the 24 class. I think you're fine at running back, assuming Bucky leaves, which he, which he will. Yeah, I think that's the fair assumption to make. Uh, these are luxury positions to me. Yeah, um, and, if, and, and if Jackson Powers Johnson does go, that does make me go, okay, you're replacing two of your interior guys with Stephen Jones also gone. So maybe you, you take a look. But yeah, Strother has more eligibility. Um, I imagine Angi Lau maybe could petition for something just because he didn't play at all here. I don't know exactly yeah. how that works or if it's even He did wild. walk. Yeah, true. I don't even know if It'd it's It would be time wild. to get a job. Yeah, I'm just wondering if his body's done. I think that's kind of where I'm at. But, you know, he was one of those guys who blew, had a pretty significant leg injury. Maybe it just didn't didn't heal the way you wanted it. So, but no, I, I think, I think, Running back to me, if you add somebody, he's you're, you're adding like a, a potential all conference caliber running back. That's who you're going after, an all American caliber running back. You don't need depth. You've got plenty of good players. Um, and if Noah's injury maybe is like really going to keep him out, maybe it's really serious and, and it's going to keep him out for part of the season. Maybe I'm more interested in taking another running back. But like I think Jordan James has proven himself. I I'm really high on Noah. You, you know, you know, obviously he missed part of this year, and we don't know what exactly will be back uh, or be like when he's back. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily see much need there. Like in, as a luxury position in the offensive line, it would just be an interior guy. But I also go, I think Struthers, somebody who's certainly capable of filling in. Obviously, we're all high on Poncho, and like I don't sleep on like Dave Iuli and Kavika Rogers. These guys have been seemingly developing yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. So I think you're fine on either of those spots if you took somebody. I, I would expect just with the number of bodies on the offensive line that they'll poke around and see if they can find an upgrade or two. But yeah, I, I don't think it's one you absolutely. It's not a necessity that they go grab two or three guys. I do believe the running back position is something that they should go after. Um, reason being, I think I agree. I had Bucky going pro. He should go pro. Doesn't need to accomplish anything else. Um, I I just wonder. No Whittington and his injury. Um, I, I have full confidence in Jordan James being the number one guy. And in fact, I think even if no Whittington is back to a hundred percent pre-injury, James is running back. Number one. I, I think Oregon didn't utilize him enough with Bucky Irving on the team. The last couple of weeks, especially in Vegas, that James should have gotten a couple more touches than what Bucky did. But even though you're, your confidence and my confidence is high on Dowdell is high on Lamar. And I know you've got a running back coming in already as well. Um, I don't, I don't like having one proven guy at the position and I understand Whittington is proven, but he's coming off a major knee injury. We don't know what he's going to look like. And that's a big risk to make. Um, not knowing how his, he's going to translate right away over to the football field and with a major knee injury at that position. I also d do think you don't just take, you know, a middle tier transfer portal guy. I, I think if Oregon goes and gets somebody at this position, it's going to be a name we don't know about yet. That's not in the portal. And to what Jared said, it's going to be one of the best running backs in the country. Um, will one of those guys enter the portal? We'll have to find out. But if they do, I expect Oregon to put full court press on one of those guys as if they are a quarterback or a star receiver that Oregon is going after. Yeah, that's fair. I just, uh, 
you know me, I think running backs are only as good as their offensive line. And sure. If and uh, I think no Winnington, I think it this is gonna sound strange. I think it benefits Oregon that he was hurt early in the season because it gives him, you know, gives him the rest of the season to to recover, gives him a full offseason to recover. Um, and you're hoping that he comes back at hundred percent. I thought there were a bunch of games this year where I thought that Noah Winnington was missed because he's just a bigger, more versatile back, and a, and he's significantly better than Jordan James or uh, Bucky Irving in pass block. So I think there were multiple games where he was missed. Um, I think he and James would battle it out for that number one spot. Um, and I think you really like what you saw from Lamar and Dante Dowdell in their limited roles. Um, they were running with the second-team offensive line, more or less, but – um, I think that this is, despite for all the talent that they had in the backfield, this was a one-two back system. I think it would have been very similar to what Kenny Dillingham looked like when he had all of his running backs at his at his uh, at will, basically, and just use Bucky and Noah. Um, I think if that were if Noah were healthy all season long, I think it would have been similar. Um, just based off how the usage was down the stretch of this season, where it was just it was just Jordan and, and Bucky, um, the true freshmen, despite how talented they were, just didn't see the field unless it was a blowout. Um, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll wrap up this uh, discussion on portal targets or portal needs, and maybe discuss a couple targets as well. All right, welcome back to the Ots and Audibles podcast. We are. Diving into portal needs, portal targets, which positions are important. Um, there's a couple spots left, Jared. Why don't you run through your wild card and also the, the other positions? Yeah, no, just one spot left, my wild card. Um, kicker. Oh, sorry. There's two spots left. You were right, man. I, I mis- misread this. Uh, the last low priority was linebacker. Um, I just don't expect a lot of guys to leave other than Jamal Hill. And uh, because he's out of eligibility, um, I'd be I'd be decimated if Devin Jackson left because he's my favorite player on the team. But um, I I don't expect him to leave. Um, and I think Oregon obviously is bringing in three or four linebackers to help with depth. And you obviously don't want a true freshman and linebacker to play. You'd much rather prefer having a guy with some veteran experience. But I think because Justin Jacobs was hurt at the beginning of the season. That probably means that he'll stick around for another year. I believe that will be his final year of eligibility next year if he decides to stick around, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, eligibility rules are still so so annoying from COVID. But um, Jeffrey Boss, I expect to return. Bryce Betcher, obviously Devin Jackson. Uh, Connor Soley, I think, is gone. Um, but Justin Jacobs paired with Braden Platt, Kavar Mathuti, Dylan Williams. Um, Jerry Mixon is another guy. I just think they're going to have a lot of depth there. If they really wanted to go and try to swing big and maybe somebody leaves and they need to replace them, sure. But I think it's extremely low priority for this team. Yeah, not much to add. Uh, be curious to see if Braden Platt, the true freshman, could make an impact. Talking about just building out depth, obviously wouldn't expect him to play a ton, but he is one of the highest rated linebacker recruits that the school has signed. Um, physically ready to. But um, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they don't lose enough to really prioritize this position. And I thought Justin and Jeff played pretty darn good on the stretch. Jeff, Jeff again, I was probably my most improved along with Steve Stevens for this team. I just thought he mm-hmm. really took strides and played really, really well. And the fact that he's back is super valuable or should be back. He, he will have a decision to make is, is super valuable, not just because of what he does on the field, but his leadership and those sort of intangibles too. He is clearly one of the top guys in this team in terms of the culture. So um, having him back, assuming that does happen as a captain of your defense would be really, really significant. Yeah. I, I had both Bossa and Jacobs on that. Should they go or should they stay list? I had both saying they should come back. Um, but look, we've seen stranger things. We've seen guys go pro when, their draft stocks aren't very high. Sometimes guys are just done with school. I don't get the impression of either one of those players, but um, you never know. And today's day and age, as we've learned through the portal, um, through high school recruiting, and, and everything in, involved in sports right now, the unexpected happens. Um, mm-hmm. But I do agree that 
they're probably good here at this position. They don't really need to add much. Um, but if if there's a elite linebacker that calls you and says, "Hey, I'm I'm really interested in playing for you guys. I I, I really would like to transfer here." You have to explore that opportunity um, because if that allows you to bring along a guy like Platt, like Eric mentioned, maybe he doesn't have to play right away unless his on-field play in fall camp forces Oregon to do it, much like Poncho this season um, along the offensive line. Like that would be a nice luxury to have, but it's it's not a necessity. Yeah, it's at that point it would be an entire luxury. Um, yeah. You'd also have to – send somebody home or tell somebody it would be a good idea if you joined the transfer portal, um, which is a tough decision. And uh, cause there's a lot of talent in that linebacker room. And um, well, I think they could find a guy. It wouldn't probably be in the linebacker room though. Yeah. But then you add, you just add another linebacker. I mean, they're going to next year, if everybody who's committed and roles, they're going to have eight linebackers, seven linebackers, um, which is a lot. I mean, granted, we all remember the linebacking year of 2021 where three of them suffered season-ending injuries, but um, it's just a lot of guys in that linebacking room. But, yeah, no, you 100% you take the call. I don't know who would be the guy calling, but you you take the call. All right, last one. Uh, I lied earlier and said that it was only one. There's actually two. Uh, the wild card of my transfer portal positions of needs is kicker. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how much I have to say here. We all know why. Uh, if Grant Meters can't live up to the billing of being like the a top five kicker in the country, according to Chris Saylor, for whatever that's worth, um, they are going to need to go get a kicker. Yep. They need a kicker. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, maybe Grant Meters is incredible, but we've just run through this going with the young kicker deal early on his career before and going through the lumps. It's not great. And, Oregon's at a position where they're competing for wanting to compete for significant things and you can't have a kicker go through some growing pain. So I think, I think if you can find somebody who's a multiple year starter, you go grab them. Um, I don't know what the kicker market will look like. Frankly, I have a hard time tracking how good it's been. I have no idea even if it's been very good in the past, but high school kickers are hard to track. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Mortal guys. This is why this is as Jared just chosen it a wild card because it's it is harder to know. Like we'll, we'll get into a second. We're going to talk about targets, and we each have probably half a dozen quarterbacks that are like guys. Oregon will be probably linked to. I, I don't know what the kicker market will be, but if you can get a guy who's got a couple years of starting experience and is proven to be fairly accurate, you go get him. All right, uh, I'm not even going to address it because there's not much that hasn't been said. Um, yeah. that's totally fine. It's an easy one to, to pick here. Uh, all right, let's transition now to names to watch. Um, I've got a list of 20 guys. I put it up Sunday night, right around when the portal officially opened. And there were certainly ones, the, the guys that I listed on that, on that list were players that had either come out and said that they were in the portal or had been reported that they were going into the portal. The number one target's not on that list because he hadn't said anything until this morning, and that's Dylan Gabriel, uh, Oklahoma starting quarterback. Um, Eric and I were in Vegas, obviously, for the game, and we talked about the rumors circulating around him, and if if he did go in, Oregon would be involved. They are involved. Um, that To me, that's the number one target above Cam Ward, and I think Cam Ward's probably the second one. We know that there's interest there as well. Um Dante Moore's name has officially been linked into it. Uh, our colleague on 24-7 Sports, Alan Triu, has reported that Oregon is going to be a major player for that player as well, Dante Moore. Um, I think your quarterback hierarchy is probably those three guys, and then there's going to be a big gap between those three and DJU from Oregon State. Um, I think, unfortunately, for uh, that family – uh, for DJ, if he gets to Oregon, a lot of things have to transpire for that to become a reality, and it probably won't. Um, so if you're in that camp of rooting for the brother connection at Oregon, it's probably not going to happen. But, again, strange things have happened. Maybe maybe they go there. Um, to Jared's point, this is priority number one, because if you can 
find an elite quarterback to add to the portal, which we've all said that they should do. Um, that's going to set the tone for the rest of the position groups that they go after and some of the names that they want to go after. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What do you, what do you think about taking a veteran guy to start this year and then taking Dante Moore and that be, and yeah. that be your developmental guy? And I ask that because if you're Ty Thompson and Oregon goes and adds Dylan Gabriel, I think your name's in the portal now too. I'm just saying, I, mean, I don't know how, I mean, Ty's been extremely patient to his credit. Does he want to have a fourth year where he's going up against – I mean, Dylan Gabriel has been a starting quarterback for half a decade. I mean, he was, he's was he been around for a really long time. I don't think he's going to Oregon to be a backup or to even have that as a possibility. Obviously, they would say it's an open competition, but Ty would know, Dylan would know, everybody around the program would know what the plan was. So if you're Ty Thompson and they do get Dylan Gabriel, I'm guessing your foot's out the door. And if that's the case, that opens up that quarterback room a lot where – Maybe it does make sense to make you know bring on Dante more as your developmental guy for a year and hope that that turns out. So um, that's kind of where my head was at the last twelve hours or so since it became more clear that Gabriel's name would go in, mm -hmm. and and obviously Moore's name had already been linked before. So I don't know. I could see them actually taking two here, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Ty never actually gets that opportunity at Oregon, which. For some, would be kind of a bummer, but hey, this is an operation where you've got to try to win football games, and you don't want to be waiting around just like we talked about with a kicker. You don't want to have that inexperience. Yeah. You can go get a, if you can go get a guy like Dylan Gabriel or a Cam Ward, they are far more reliable in terms of winning you 10, 11, whatever, how many football games you want than, than Ty Thompson is next year, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I like Cam Ward more than I like Dylan Gabriel, and but that's more of a personal preference, but if Oregon were to go down that route, Eric, with either Ward or Gabriel, whoever you want, and then Dante Moore, ooh-wee, that'd be fun. Um, again, I'll say it for the millionth time, I love DJ Uyunglele. I love him as a quarterback. He's just never – everything has never clicked. It's very similar to how I've described Dante Manning. He has all the physical traits and tools. It just all hasn't clicked at being the quarterback. So I think if Oregon were to land him, I, I actually, I don't even think Oregon would ever land him. Um, I think that that's more of like a, a pipe dream. This would be cute if the two brothers played together on the same team. DJU is just not going to give you that opportunity to win at the high level that you would rather get with Cam Ward or Dylan Gabriel, whatever one um, Oregon staff would rather prefer. Um, a recent name. Two recent names are on my list that both jumped in the portal today. B.J. Green, defensive lineman, Arizona State. He was um, going to be my first guy to bring up. Yeah, he just jumped in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, stud, total stud. Yeah, we, we talked about him before the ASU podcast. Like He was the second coming of somebody really good. And... You know, I think he had a tackle for loss or two against Oregon. Um, he's an undersized dude. He's only – I'm going to go pull up his listed weight. I know he's six foot one, 270 pounds. He plays in the interior, but, yeah. man, is he good. Um, he's, he's, just like a, a, he's like an undersized door list in terms of he could play all over the line. Right. He's what Mario Cristobal wished Brandon Buckner was. Mm. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um <laughs> but I think that's a real target. Um, I already confessed my love for Cam Ward. Um, obviously, uh, another one that just entered was TCU Cordell Russell. Uh, he was number 65 in the class of 23. Um, just a dude who I think needs some more seasoning on him, needs some more college experience, but certainly worth a flyer. And uh, at the end of the day, if I were Oregon, I would put, 75% of my NIL budget on Walter Nolan. I don't think that there's a better answer on this list. I would honestly, I don't know. I think Nolan is neck and neck right there with me for Cam Ward on the number one option because, man, that's a guy. That's not just a dude. That's a guy. He's really, really good. And him in this Oregon defense, when they absolutely need some interior defensive line, Help would be critical. I think that would help so much. I think that he would be the best defense, interior defensive lineman other than Brandon Dorless on this team the, this past season, and he would easily be the best this upcoming season. So those are my four guys. Um, I don't – it's still very early. 
I think that there's some clear top end talent, but um, I think like in a week there's going to, we could all have a list of 10 to 12 guys who we could really see Oregon going after. I, I just wanted to circle back on the quarterback and I agree. Gabriel uh, Ward, those should be your top two experienced guys. I think Dante would be a great developmental guy if he's willing, by the way, to be patient. If, if they miss on some of these guys, what, what's your feeling on Kyle McCord? I was a little, I wouldn't say taken aback, but he was at least the starting quarterback on a team that was a field goal away from making the playoff this year. And yeah. statistically, it's not incredible, but it's not I bad guess. either. So that's just another name. Yeah, I, he, I don't know. We heard a lot of all year about how Ohio State won despite its poor play of passing, despite having one of what some people think the best receiver in the country, Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, that kind of raises flags, but it sure. would it would be a solid addition to your point. The, the, the dude did go 11 and 1 this season. Um, that he's a high profile player at the very least, yes. Yes. I had a couple names um, at defensive back. Um, should Kyrie Jackson either go pro or be out of eligibility? We don't really know that yet. Um, Des Malone, San Diego State cornerback, uh, started for them the last couple of seasons. He's got the height Oregon likes, 6'2". And PFF graded him out better than any corner on Oregon's roster, or safety, I should matter. Uh, except for Kyrie Jackson um, and Jalil Florence. Uh, this is a guy that had better grades than Bridges, Manning, Reed, and Tysheem Johnson. Um, you like his height. You like his, his productivity at, at San Diego State. Um, another kind of safety name is Deshaun Pace from Cincinnati. Um this is a guy that fits a lot of what Oregon does defensively. He's 6'3". Um, he has played outside linebacker. He has played safety. And he's played the star position for the Bearcats over his first three seasons of college football. Um, and when I mean play, I mean start at all those spots. Uh, he has bounced around and he's been very productive. Um, I, I think... Oregon has a need for safety help. This is a guy that that could probably do that. Um, and then last but not least, I have Josh Kelly, Washington State receiver. Um, that's another guy. There's a list of 20 names. We'll have more added onto the site, as like Jared said. Like It's very early in the process. Um, some of these guys on this list that I had wouldn't be here if I made it at 10, 20 a.m., Monday morning because so many new names have entered the portal. And that's the beauty of the portal is every day a bigger name jumps in. But right now, Josh Kelly is a productive receiver, um, was a really good receiver at Fresno State before that, is is in the portal, is looking to leave. You've, you're losing Troy Franklin, potentially even Tez Johnson. And I think that's a guy that could elevate the receiver room or push Tez as the go-to guy next season if he comes back. All I would say is I think Kelly's a great name to have near the top today. I'm yes. going to guess a week, two weeks, three weeks down the road when more names drop out, right. he, might not, he might not be your number yep. one receiver priority. Because I'm expecting I – mean, I don't have names off the top of my head, but I, I'm expecting there to be an active receiver market, and Oregon will be one of the bigger buyers. So I, yes. Kelly would not be at all a, a poor addition. I think he could no, be a really no, good no. starting caliber player. I just – there might be more upside down the line. So it'd be interesting to see how Oregon kind of plays their hand, if you will. At can I well, go for it? Can I uh, already offer you an upgrade over Kelly? Sure. Please do. Please do. Julian Fleming. Ooh. Yeah. Former Did he just number go one wide receiver that, in the country. That, yeah. that just happened. <laughs> yeah. It happened this morning. Okay. Yeah. I've not seen that. So to Matt's point, if he had written this 10 hours later, it'd probably be, 12 or 13, 14, 15 new names, maybe an entire new top 20. But there's a, uh, I mean, it's just going to keep happening. It is only, again, it is only 10, 20 Pacific standard time. So there's plenty um, of time. And just to give you, like I, I made that comment earlier that um, I think this is the easiest position to fill. And that's why to Eric's point, like you wait because more names are going to pop up. And even if it means you miss out on a Josh Kelly, 
other names will emerge that can be as productive, if not more productive, um, on this list. Because on the I have a list, I have a list of guys, and there's multiple receivers here, and there's one receiver who averaged over 21 yards a catch and had over a thousand yards this season. There's um, another receiver that played at FIU that went over 1100 yards and had, had six touchdowns. Like it's incredibly easy at this position to go and find multiple playmakers, basically at any point in the portal process. And so to Eric's point, he's, he's right. Like, Oregon can be very selective here. And then towards Jared's point of what the quarterback that they land, that will only enhance what players want to come to Oregon. And so if you're Oregon, I I don't think it's in your best interest uh, to take a portal QB in the first week or receiver in the first week, unless a Cam Ward, a Dylan Gabriel, or someone else at that quarterback position today, tomorrow, Wednesday, whatever comes in and says, I'm going to Oregon, and then you'll get a true sense of who's truly interested and who you should maybe go after. Yeah, agreed. All right, that's going to do it for us here on the Odds and Audibles podcast. Thank you for listening to the show. We'll be back uh, on Wednesday for more talk on the portal, uh, breaking down the news that's happened since today. We'll also discuss – um, some portal offers, if any, go out, which we should expect to see. And by the way, there's also high school recruiting. Um, yep. <laughs> before any high school or before any transfer portal kid has an Oregon offer that's publicly known, Oregon's offered three high school kids today. Um, they're all underclassmen, but checkers, offered, chess, man. Checkers yeah, and they, chess. They've offered high school kids. Um, Oregon also got a commitment last weekend. We'll break that down. One of their top commits made a, an, an, a, an official visit to another school last weekend so we'll discuss that as well so there's still high school football recruiting signing day is 16 days away we'll break that all down as well on wednesday's show but until then you've been listening to the odds and audibles podcast talk to you later folks peace